session is John Seely Brown. John Seely Brown has had the kind of diverse career that produces powerful insights into social organization and change. He identifies his personal interests as including the management of radical innovation and new forms of communication and learning. Few people are as recognized as he is as an incisive thinker on how to create a better future. His books include A New Culture of Learning, The Power of Pull, The Social Life of Information, and The Only Sustainable Edge, all of which, I might add, are highly rated and available on Amazon. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming John Seely Brown. Ah, thank you, thank you. It's, it's a great pleasure to be here, actually to be here again. I think I spoke here two, four, six years ago in the, the Lane Conference. Um, and I feel like my talk is kind of wedged between Jim's fantastic talk and yours, Amy. Um, I'm gonna be a little bit more down in the weeds, um, but I think we're gonna touch all these points from a different, slightly different perspective. I've been looking at this issue that we're facing more from the point of view of in this networked age we're in, um, how do we think about preparing ourselves or preparing folks to become entrepreneurial learners? By entrepreneurial, I don't mean to be entrepreneurs. I mean to be able to always be picking things up around us to learn more and more and more. Increasingly important in a world of constant change. Um, so quick, let me go over some comments on our context. You've heard much of these contexts already by Jim and Amy. Um, and then let's delve into how we may actually play out in this new context. I guess the first part where I start from is a belief in the exponential infrastructures that we have um, that in fact the half-life of most of our skills today have really shrunk. In many ways, it may be down to like five to eight years. Not all skills, but many of them. That means Yes, we can get educated in the university, but we must think about the arc of life learning at least as important as the university uh, itself. Um, and in fact, there's a major shift from thinking about how do you build up stocks of assets that actually stay with you for life to how do you actually move to participating on the edge of things happening, participating in the flows of knowledge, in fact, in the stocks of knowledge, we were used to fixed genres. We knew how to read those genres. Now we're moving into a world of fluid genres where not only do we have to learn how to read, but we have to learn how to relearn how to read, having to do with different types of genres. If you think you read Wikipedia like you do Britannica, you will be screwed. Um, <laughs> it is a different reading practice to know how to read Wikipedia. In fact, if you don't know how to pull up the edit pages of Wikipedia, you are in trouble. Um, you have to see what's still being contested uh, versus what has been solidified because Wikipedia gives us a, a view into the back room of Britannica that we never got a chance to see, the kinds of debates that go on behind the scenes. Um, but I'm also struck by a fantastic kind of comment that Carla Hesse brought out uh, some time ago at Berkeley let me just read. Knowledge is no longer that which is contained in a space, but that which passes through it like a series of vectors, each having direction and duration without precise location or limit. In the, f in the future, it seems there will be no fixed canons of text, no fixed epistemological boundaries between disciplines, only paths of inquiry, modes of integration, and moments of encounter. I think that simple quote captures so much of where we're headed. Um, but I want to add to that a brand new book that came out by David Weinberger, Too Big to Know, looking at what the internet age has really happened to us. 
We used to know how to know. We got answers from books or experts. We nailed down the facts and moved on. We had cannons. But in that age, knowledge has moved onto the networks. More knowledge than ever, but it's different. Topics again. Topics have no boundaries. Nobody agrees on anything. Pretty accurate. But let's step back. We all here agree on the increasing value and significance of science and technology to work on large-scale problems and for those positions to help them position ourselves in the competitive world. But is this just sufficient or not? I want to step back with Chuck uh, and look at the National Academy of Engineering's grand challenges. Here they are listed. But I want to add, as Chuck knows, one question on top of that. Please note that each of these challenges requires an integrated or interdisciplinary approach, a socio-technical approach in nature. Are we, in fact, honestly preparing our students for such? And I might ask, are we preparing ourselves for such? But it can't stop there. In the era of complexity and large-scale problems, we need to move from problem solving as an engineering approach to design, to design from an equal systemic perspective. Said slightly differently, no significant problem is an island to itself. For the unintended consequences to an action can often overwhelm the intended. And actually quoting uh, Anne, we begin to understand the interconnectivity of everything from both the ecological perspective and from the human perspective. We might dwell a moment on what's the difference between the ecological perspective and the human perspective. I think we're coming to a point that we need more than just skills, more than just the skills of learning how to learn in a rapidly changing world, maybe in fact, that's not going to suffice to really push us through and carry us through the arc of life learning. How do we also do move to systems thinking, but even beyond systems thinking to ecosystemic thinking? Are those sufficient? I'm going to claim no. And I think this may go Amy, to the heart of one of the things that a university really does for us. Because I think we're going to require dispositions. I might call them new dispositions. In fact, a warning, dispositions cannot be taught. They can be cultivated. I think we must think, as we do unconsciously here, uh, implicitly here, how by the experience of being on campus with many disciplines rubbing against us all the time, how do we cultivate these dispositions? Not teach, but cultivate. And of course we do that in libraries, laboratories, seminar rooms, and I'm going to dwell a moment on studios as a very interesting space or environment to think about how we might accelerate our ability to cultivate. But first, let's look at the dispositions of what I'm going to call the entrepreneurial learner that's capable of feeling at home with radical change and feeling comfortable in constantly tackling new problems and also picking up new knowledge on the fly. Here are the properties that I find so important for this entrepreneurial learner. One is curiosity, constantly pulling information on demand. Jim, this goes to the essence of the internet. How do we learn on demand? How do we pull information on demand? But you do that in the context of constantly questing. Questing. How do you seek, uncover, and probe? And in fact, for those of us in this room that happen to be hardcore gamers like in World of Warcraft, questing is what that game is really about. Constantly pulling, constantly reading the world to see what are the resources I can now use in a novel way to solve the problems at hand. But also in this world of radical, if not exponential change, how do we actually think seriously about reframing? Not how do we accept the problems as given or the point of view as given, but how do we play with new frames to see if we can actually make sense of the world in quite different ways? 
And key to making this all work out, which again, I think the internet turns out to help us a great deal, is how do we connect? How do we connect globally? How do we connect in a way that we listen and engage others? I'm gonna add later, listening with humility um, becomes increasingly important as we listen across disciplinary silos. So how do we afford curiosity? This actually was a random shot taken by uh, the guy I work with, um, his, his two kids, and it just struck me. Here's a two-year-old and here's a five-year-old. Um, these are our students, soon to be. Uh, and how in this network age are they constantly questing, constantly pulling information and thinking about things? Um, it's a nice kind of picture that keeps me up at night I always hold it in the back of my mind. It leads me to think maybe we do need, sometimes, maybe we do need new approaches to learning, new practices, and maybe a new approach to thinking and acting. And I want to come back to the notion of acting, uh, which I think is turning out to be very important. So let me just say in this context, the understanding of complex adaptive systems, which is the world's we're dealing in now and almost all of the problems that Jim come up in the grand challenges um, um, isn't a passive activity and so can be done within just one discipline. In fact, for the interesting folks, for the folks particularly interested in the medical arena, think about how we're now viewing cancer. Cancer could be better thought of as cancering a very complex process that needs to be probed, understood in that probe, and know how to kind of then manage that process. Um, and so how do you actually think about this sense of probing, um, not just studying or just making measurements, but actively probing and seeing how systems respond? And of course, in engineering, we're used to that in certain types of systems, uh, but in this game, the systems themselves are under change through the probing itself unlike electronic circuits that we know well how to send a spike signal in and read the responses. Um, so what do we need from our students? What do we want? I put a slightly different twist on it, but I think it all comes to the same of both what Jim and Amy were saying. How do we actually cultivate a resilient mindset, an ability to change, adapt, reconceptualize, and engage in the sense of deep listening with humility, but do it in an act, reflect, provisional loop. I'm gonna come back to why do I say provisional and what do I mean by act and reflect. Um, we can learn, I think, a lot from stepping back and looking at how design practice actually functions, in particular, architectural design. Um, I must say that, uh, you know, Jim, when you threw up that first picture of Michigan, uh, I started out actually judging cows, working on a farm. <laughs> but for about 40 years, I have been actually uh, uh, on the periphery of many, many architectural studios, actually starting at MIT. <laughs> um, and I've been really impressed um, just exactly how architects think. I'll come back to why architecture itself may give us some insights into how to do a kind of integration and how to bring thinking and acting together. But said most simply, design is an inquiry, is a way of seeing the world. It's a way of discovering the interconnectedness of things. Designers are by nature both entrepreneurial and optimistic. And this is the thing that really got me, is designers, they see to act, but they act to see. We begin to understand the world through action, not just by observation. Again, going back to the sense of how do you probe provisionally, and then how do you see the responses of that in these complex, nonlinear, highly nonlinear systems. Um, but the beauty to me, in terms of how the architect looks at the world, is this beautiful integration of hand and head. It is not just head, nor is it just hand. 
I think this may be the deepest kind of integration of hand in hand, because we do think with our whole body, not just with our head. Um, and so let's look at how an architectural studio actually functions, training students, and see how we may pick up a couple of lessons from that to see if it much more universally applies to creating or being able to amplify cultivation of these kind of spirits, dispositions that I was talking about earlier. You know, first of all, kind of recognize that in an architectural studio, you constantly, as I was saying earlier, you interleave thinking and doing, thinking again with both head and hand. But critically, in the architectural studio, it is an environment of permission, permission to try and fail and fail and fail, fail over and over again in the company of others. One of the key properties of an architectural studio, both at the university level and afterwards, is all work in progress is always made public. So you're not afraid to be seen as failing. In fact, you see everybody else failing. And from that, you also learn, going back to cultivation, in terms of what are the dispositions that enable you to survive that way, pardon me, to thrive that way. Let's go one step further. It is also a collective learning experience with both master critiquing going on and peer critiquing going on. In order to actually have this arc of life learning, we're going to have to think about peer-based critiquing and mentoring, and also master-based mentoring. Um, and this does actually start to develop a disposition for knowing how to actually give critiques. Let's look at this a little bit more seriously. Let me show you, in basically any architectural studio, three kinds of critiques that go on. The top left-hand desk critique is basically, although done in an architectural studio publicly, it is basically a one-on-one -on -one critique. The master sits down with the student um, and actually goes over the student's design uh, at that moment in time. That critique being given is overheard by all the other students because basically all the other students have been working on the same problem. So they've created the context, they've watched the struggles, and so, by the way, you have a kind of efficiency here, because basically this critique over here, I begin to, I know the struggles that that person just went through, so I can start to interpret some of that same critique. But that's just one kind of critique. The next second critique actually is a slightly more public critique, where all the students of the studio get together, and a bunch of the faculty get together, and they go through critiquing one student project at another. Okay? And what actually happens there is now you begin to understand how different people go about critiquing things, and if done right, suddenly the students start to critique each other in that context. And then the third and final, usually the final review in an architectural studio, is when you bring in the outside experts. And those outside experts will then critique, hopefully productively, uh, what you're doing. Now, the purpose of the critique here is not criticism. The purpose of the critique is actually is a kind of a mode of inquiry that actually is meant to create a movement. In fact, it's interesting to me in engineering schools, some of our biggest arguments are the difference between criticism and critique. How critique actually moves you ahead where criticism you actually shy away from. Uh, you kind of fear being given criticism, but critique actually unfolds and unpacks and lets you begin to see the problem in a new type of way. So these are the types of experiences that are already being developed, but I think are going to end up applying more and more to looking at these bigger problems that inherently are socio-technical in nature and cross all kinds of boundaries. So let's look at a bigger picture for the moment. And what we're getting at here is kind of a blended epistemology that we're all used to in this room in terms of how do you bring together homo sapien, man is knower, and homo faber, man is maker. 
And we're all used to, in this room, used to making things. So homophobic means usually making content or making things. But Jim has talked about the internet. Are we really aware that now in this digital world we live in, we don't make just things. We actually make contexts. Context is as easy to make now as things. That is a huge change. It's a huge change because, in fact, meaning emerges as much from context as content. And in the past, we had to kind of stick with stable contexts in which we can actually change content. But now we can actually, actually keep the content stable and shift to context and look at the interplay between these two things. In fact, if you want to know what everybody thinks they're doing with Remix, Remix is actually changing context. Um, in fact, it is amazing to me, uh, I love giving these assignments out, to take a movie, or take a movie trailer, or take a movie, forget the lawyers, or take a movie, um, and give the assignment to build a new music track for that movie. If you do that, you will not only change the meaning of that movie, you will actually change what you see. I don't know, Kathy, if you've experienced this, but I've taken Jurassic Park, I've changed the music in a way, taking one of the most dramatic scenes in that movie where the, where the dinosaur chomps the person. Um, guess what? It never happened. It's not there. It is the sound that makes you think it happened. Uh, I will change it so you don't see it at all, because uh, it's not there. Uh, these are the things you begin to understand, the power in terms of constructing context and content simultaneously uh, in order to actually affect new forms of communication uh, and therefore perhaps new forms of meaning creation. Um, that's my little story. Um, so I just want to kind of say as we move here that kind of in this world we're now living in, of social media, and this network knowledge, um, context is more fluid than ever. And let me take another example, because basically blogging is actually changing context, or creating contexts. And in fact, it's very interesting to take Andy Sullivan, um, and he wrote a beautiful paper of why I blog, Andy Sullivan for the Atlantic Monthly. Uh, and let me just kind of read his comment. The blogger is, more than any writer of the past, we might argue that, but a node among other nodes, connected but unfinished without the links and the comments and the trackbacks that make the blogosphere at best a conversation, not a production. A very interesting analogy he comes up with. Jazz and blogging are intimate, improvisational, and individual but also inherently collective, and the audience talks over both. How might we actually rethink the essence of crowdsourcing and collective intelligence from the intimate kind of connections we're talking about here, the furthest thing from just putting colored paper up on the walls? A different kind of conversation happens here. Um, so let's go back to the grand challenges. And notice, we did ask the question of how do you take a socio-technical approach? Well, think about it a moment. The social part is looking at the context. The technical part is looking at the thing. How do we now understand the interplay between context and content in terms of a socio-technical approach to these problems? Um, and I want to say that the kind of the key to me in architectural design, almost think about the way that landscape architecture works with architecture. The whole catch is how do I construct a landscape around the thing I've just built? So the meaning of that thing I've just built becomes much more apparent as I approach it because the landscaping has already set the context to be able to understand that. Um, and so we begin to see various ways that we can have a fairly rich interplay here um, that comes from this more kind of architectonic approach.
But the catch here is we're really dealing with ecosystemic design where we can do both context and content. And the reason I bring that up is because almost every problem we're talking about here today is basically starting with healthcare and affordability, et cetera, et cetera, uh, are wicked problems. Wicked problems can be defined as complex systems. Think healthcare. Think cancer, by the way, is a tiny complex adaptive system. Wickedly, <laughs> bad sense of wicked. But, um, complex systems that are constantly evolving with each attempt to understand to solve it. Best thought of as an environment, not an isolated problem. Um, the very essence of a socio-technical. Um, and we're not used to dealing with those types of problems. We're used to dealing with problems that are more or less stable. And in today's world, starting to solve any of these wicked problems already changes the problem. Um, so think now about, and going back, Amy, to your point of integrated, I want to kind of just dwell a moment on design as a platform for simultaneously working on a problem, which is what I do as an engineer, but also a platform for working in the world, in the problem. So take Medicare. How much do I begin to understand the feeling of the patient as I think about ways to change medical care? I'm operating on, but I also have to be able to put myself in. In fact, if you see some of the most radical breakthroughs of how we're looking at cancer, you actually think now about being simultaneously on and in to understand that as well. Um, so this sense is our challenge to how to not have an either or, but a both and. And how do we prepare ourselves in, to be able to handle those types of problems? I'm gonna argue, in a way, this means that the humanities I think you just, uh, the this is a cl actually classic illustration. This clock arose last night at a conversation, the need for the speakers to have a clock. So you've just demonstrated your point about unintended quant consequences. So if I could watch the clock carefully, how much time no, do I have? No, you're, 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 fi you're fine. Oh. Oh. oh, this means. <laughs> That the humanities, <laughs> uh, sorry, uh, are more important than ever because it's humanities that lets us see, be in the problem, whereas in some sense the sciences and engineering lets us operate on the problem. So the simultaneity of being in and being on may turn out to be an interesting abstraction here. Um, and I think if you're going to handle the types of complex, adaptive, wicked problems that I'm talking about, you can't either be just outside of them, which is the way policies get developed, or you can't be just in inside them. You have to be simultaneously both and understand that interplay. And said most simply, I think the research university's job is to prepare st students to be simultaneously on and in. Um, and that means that humanities is not just a luxury. Um, it actually serves a critical role for being in the problems um, as well. Um, and by the way, I, well, let me stop that. Um, so this sense of being on and in may, in this kind of vehicle I was just talking about, may actually be a hint toward a solution to C.P. Snow's on two cultures. And by thinking about how can I be simultaneously and effectively both on and in um, and approach to kind of working on these wicked problems may actually be not, may be the reason why we have to solve his challenge and it may happen automatically if we create the environments and the context to be able to do that. Um, so I'd like to throw up the question of the grand challenges but ask it slightly differently. What would the grand challenges be if set forth by the American Academy of Arts and Sciences? 
not just, sorry Chuck, National Academy of Engineering. <laughs> um, would they be different? Would they be framed differently? Would they have a new set of eyeglasses on these things? Um, because I think this is what we have to think about as we go forward. So one kind of summary of this is kind of where imaginations play, learning happens, but in an inherently um, androgynous environment. Androgynous in the sense of bringing together on and in science and technology on the one hand and humanities on the other hand in this androgynous kind of point of view. But to do that, we have to kind of create environments that honestly pull, have the problem or the environment pull these different points of view together. There's nothing that worked worse at Xerox Park where I spent most of my life uh, is to say, okay, I'm going to get the sociologists, the anthropologists, the physicists, and the mathematicians, the computer scientists together, and we're going to attack this problem. Uh, the problem itself has to pull the people. And the problem going to the root of that problem is what has to yank people into now marinating in that space from their different perspectives. Um, so yes, it's much easier to say than to do, uh, but we have to think about these environments. And so the last couple of slides uh, have to do with stepping back further out, um, what that might mean. I just want to say in a curious way that in a world of constant change where reframing becomes increasingly important, um, how do we create the willingness of our students to regrind their conceptual lenses in order to make sense of looking at their problem? Because very often in the world is changing as much as we're in, our frames aren't right. At Chile is the case in intelligence, but most of the rest of the world is also not right. Uh, how do we do this? And that got several of us to start stepping back and saying, what's the role of play? You know, in a curious sort of way, our kids today, the youngest ones, before the two, maybe around the two, you know, actually engages in play, whack-a-mole, dot, 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 repetitive things. And through that process, they're actually constructing their frames through which then we pour knowledge. So it is a play that actually constructs the frame. Maybe play, contrary to what we thought, is increasingly important in a world of radical change where we have to be willing to provisionally play with problems in order to figure if there is a new way to frame the problem. Um, so I wanted to call our attention, which often doesn't get talked about much, especially in the epistemological literature, of not just homo faber, homo um, uh, uh, um, sapiens, but homo ludens, a highly nuanced form of play brought to us by uh, um, our friend Johann Hosingi. Uh, in his writings, in fact, the key to homo ludens is a sense of a freedom again, to fail, fail, fail again, and then get it right. But think about it in terms of poetry. Think about the amount of time we were struggle just trying to find the right phrase to capture something. How do you play with that in order to get it right? But most importantly, how do you think about an epiphany? You know, basically, if you can construct an epiphany for a student, that is with that student for life. If you want to talk about single shot learning, think epiphanies. Epiphany is something that brings everything together in a highly surprising way. It's like a riddle. Riddling and epiphanies go hand in hand. It is a form of play. And if you want to read a beautiful book, as you said, by uh, uh, Hosinga, see how he looks at the fact that actually play is the basis of culture, not cognition. Cognition follows later. Uh, maybe we've gotten something kind of misunderstood in terms of priority. So if you look at this kind of blended epistemology, most of us in this room, starting with myself, came up with the notion, uh, with kind of the current ratings, that almost everything is homo sapiens. Then we have homo faber, and then we have play as an accident down here in the bottom. Um, perhaps we need to think about a rebalancing in the research university as we go forward 
to understand that there could be a new kind of play that is going on that prepares us to constantly reframe things. How do we actually think about how do we connect the dots? Um, how do we actually kind of find ways through riddling to make sense so that basically we generate epiphanies, saying, oh, now that makes sense. So through this blended epistemology, we may be able to cultivate the imaginations in terms of constantly asking ourselves, what ifs, what ifs, what ifs, in terms of imagined worlds. Um, and that is one of the reasons why I think play suddenly becomes so important. So in a curious sort of way, going back to the studio again, play, technically speaking, is a space of invention and permission. We permit you to be foolish. We permit you to try things out provisionally and be wrong and wrong and wrong. Uh, and if you looked at my feeble attempts to find the right metaphor to say something, you'd see me constantly being wrong, <laughs> wrong, wrong. Uh, but it's that sense of playing. Um, and basically, this is a space to be able to try things out. So I want to say, as I kind of come to an end here, that kind of play and design are both vehicles that may help us bridge this barrier between research, our points of view of research, and learning. Where we now we're looking at how do we do both, both and, not either or. Where learning itself comes through riddling research that creates learning efficiency of enormous proportion. And in fact, you might actually say, what was the essence of the land-grant colleges? But something very close to that as well. Um, so this sense of doing both is both in terms of being comfortable with ambiguity, being comfortable with riddling, being comfortable with working as, through these what-ifs as a totally provisional construct. And that sense of working publicly, provisionally, is something that is absolutely natural inside the good architectural studios, but actually almost nowhere else. Um, and so the sense of kind of an ambidextrous environment where both of these things kind of play out. So let me end by saying where imagination plays, learning happens, both in terms of the androgynous point of view and the ambidextrous point of view. If we can bring these things together, I think we'll have magic. Thank you. How much time is left now? <laughs> You're, you ended precisely at the time you were supposed to end up. We, have, we got about 20, no, we got about maybe 20 minutes, 18 minutes left for questions. Okay. <laughs> uh, and I also want to say uh, uh, to our, our speakers who are in the front row, if you have a comment or a question, I'd be happy to bring you the microphone, which I think will make this a little bit easier. Yes, I have a question. Dr. McIntosh. <laughs> First yeah. question. <laughs> <laughs> so this was a, an enormously exciting talk. Uh, and it, it makes me uh, think your notions of reframing and connecting are so important. Uh, and so we can also, uh, as another sort of aspect of them beyond the ones that you uh, very engagingly outline, think of the global aspects of what we're thinking about today and the intersections of uh, cultural encounters and what they have meant historically, I think precisely. I am an archeologist and so I of course think about these things and there is a, a very strong idea out there that precisely the areas that engaged in trade where cultures came into contact were the most innovative and creative perhaps because it provided the opportunities for reframing, and connecting, rolling. seeing things right. in new ways. Uh, and uh, so this is another question that arises. How do we, in our universities that are becoming increasingly global, uh, international, with international students coming here with different perspectives, how do we ensure 
that there is an environment in the classroom that has that kind of humility that opens up students from different cultural perspectives where the lenses always suggest the right way, you know, a, 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 an appropriate way to look at things, but very different ways across cultures, that they actually can do that right. and have that input coming in so that things can be reframed, seen through new eyes, and those lenses reground through the cultural contact. So when I brought up the idea of the architectural studio, that was both a fact and a metaphor. And what I'm really suggesting is we may want to rethink many more of our classrooms as being structured and having the properties of these architectural studios where hand and, and mind work together provisionally trying things out um, in, in, in the presence of other folks from the different cultures. And the kinds of conversations that come up in that would just inherently bring a much greater appreciation, a much more nuanced understanding of each other's points of view. So I think that what you, know, what you see, and, and, and uh, Jim alluded to it um, in the, uh, a little bit in, in, in the Stanford comment, um, and we're looking at things called flipped instruction now, where you actually um, don't use lectures, but you actually have students do all the reading outside. I mean, Exeter f made this first famous, but, uh, and then they come to class in order to debate and to discuss problems around these things. Um, by the way, it's very much like the Teal program uh, at MIT, um, where that happens, um, although it's a slightly different bent. I think we're gonna find ways to now rethink the classrooms around these, the mechanisms of the, uh, of the architectural studios as the fundamental way to build, the, to cultivate the dispositions and to get the, the listening with humility, but listening with each other and learning how to critique each other. Because if, if we can send out students to know how to critique each other, uh, I think we're, we're, we're close to home. Uh, next, <coughs> excuse me, the question from the internet. How do we give our students permission to be quote unquote foolish? How do we incite play institutionally and in the classroom? Yeah, I, I think it, the, the, the answer to that is partially like I just said. Um, the whole purpose with a studio um, is to be able to try things out rapidly. Um, and if you think too long, about trying something out. If you ever notice kind of the role of sketching, I mean the sketch is a very provisional way to just you know, take five minutes and sketch something. Uh, and mostly it is terrible. I mean you, you will see us go through a uh, hundred sketches before we find something right. Uh, if you do that publicly with other people around, you suddenly get a, uh, you know, you start to cultivate a different disposition that like, yeah, that's what we all should be doing. Um, and so I think it, you know, this can't change overnight, but I think that, that, that we spend too much time just thinking and too little time thinking and doing. Uh, oh. No, he's not. I'm gonna take the microphone. Oh, <laughs> Jim, why'd you step here? <laughs> You have to deal with me first, then we'll let Jim. Okay, okay. Is that fair enough? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, not that he will do it anyway. You know, what you're talking about is really, it's out there now, even if you don't use the architectural studio kind of thing. Let me give you just two quick examples. So at the University of Minnesota, Rochester, they're screwing around with the most basic idea that testing is an individual art. So they actually are in some of their courses that you take the test and then you get a group and you can actually improve your score by 10 points by what the group says. There's a nice NPR, I guess, blog or what, iPod, uh, whatever they're called on it. But when you listen to the students talk about the experience, that's where all the learning took place. The hell with the 10 points, that's where all the learning took place. So at least I'm one of us who still actually teaches regularly and in a graduate program, I now insist that they submit their papers to each other before they submit them to me. And they put them on a listserv. What's really interesting is to watch what happened. In the beginning, 
sort of, if you don't look at mine, I won't look at yours, that nothing was going on. But you watched over the year as it's taken place, they are actually now looking at each other's. Of course, when I read the papers, I can see the borrowing going on, which they probably say, well, I hope you don't see it. But that's the whole point. Yeah. <laughs> you, you want that. <laughs> you want that. So, yes. it is, so it's very doable. And in this case, the internet, the fact of the, the listserv is what made it possible. So you can actually take from the, the, the real space into the virtual space and back and forth. But the real thing is, and, and I'm just underlining what you said, I'm yeah, not, yeah. is learning is public, not private. And yes. that, that may be the biggest revolution we have to overcome. It's, it's pu both public and social. Social, fair enough. Yeah, um, I mean, but, but yeah, I mean, the public part is also important uh, as well as the social. I mean, you, know, you can have social, not very public, because you're kind of embarrassed, as opposed to being, you know, proud at, at some point. Uh, you know, I'm always struck by William Gibson saying the future is already here, just not evenly distributed. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, the, uh, you know, I think it was Richard Like that originally uh, at, at Harvard, uh, you know, wrote that paper that said the best predictor of students' success at Harvard was did they know how to form or join study groups? Uh, and the, um, I mean, we could, you know, so there's a beautiful history here. Uh, and I think now this flipped instruction is going to try to take this and really scale it. Uh, yeah. Rather than do just that. Let me give you a challenge. Uh, <laughs> we think of libraries as providing the public good where people can come and use artifacts, books to know. But imagine a library that doesn't have any books, but has a 60 gigabit per second connection to the internet. That's about 250,000 square feet of space, including caves and workshops and design studios and sound stages and recording studios, open 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, surrounded by schools of engineering, architecture, art, music, computer science. And has, <laughs> and does have a shop better than Starbucks. The lattes are much better, okay? How do you make a case for that very unusual resource that I think fits right. very well to your image to you know engage I mean? a broader conventional and traditional university? Because that's the challenge I have in putting together a vision statement over the next two to three months for the head of our library system. So, you know, you're not alone, number one. Um, as you well know, and Chuck knows, you know, there's, there's the whole Fab Lab movement. Uh, there's the whole maker movement. Um, now with very, very sophisticated tools. Now you have synthetic biology that's right. You know, movement, uh, a little bit scary notion, but never mind. Um, the, um, uh, and so, you know, we're beginning to find these amazing tools that help to visualize as well as to experiment. Uh, well, this is connected con to nanofabrication facilities and yeah. about a quarter of a mile from our synthetic right. biology facility. Right, right. Uh, so I think we're, we're, we're finding that the digital generation, the younger generation, is actually ironically loving to get back to making stuff. Mm -hmm. But the making stuff is as much context as content. And that was what I didn't see for the longest time. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that when you begin to see, you know, in fact, I don't know if you've been to the public library at, in Chicago, uh, mm -hmm. but that whole first floor of that library yeah. is now around having kids construct contexts uh -huh. um, for the, for the artifacts that they're studying um, and so on. I mean, so I think that we're, you see f very interesting baby steps mm -hmm. along, that, along that path. Um, and I think you're gonna see in the next five years it really- I, th I think you're, that five years is right. I think it's moving at that pace. Right, thank you. Yeah. Uh, uh, President Gutman had a comment. I just wanted to add to um, what Jim and John have said. Any of us um, who remember back to what libraries were in the days when we were in college would not recognize some of the libraries that have now evolved. And I think the evolution's just gonna go more quickly. So at Penn, we have something called the Weigel Information Commons, and we're now creating 
an education commons, which is where um, we have our fitness center and intercollegiate weight room and the palestra. And these commons are total, they're, they're not books. They're totally computerized. They, w students are encouraged to bring food and drink in, non-alcoholic right. preferably, but, um, and they work together and there are faculty and specialists in using the internet. So that is the present, not just the future right. of libraries and the faster we you know, invite libraries and enable them to do that, the more we're going to facilitate the way young people now learn and really make, and do, not just learn, but do. So um, as I say, the future is, is already here and we just have to speed up this um, right. movement. The, the catch though. We don't have, we don't yet have performing arts space in there, partly because any of you who know how expensive performing arts space <laughs> is, realize that there are limits even to university budgets, but it is in effect a, a performing arts space for, really um, innovative thinking and using totally um, without, I mean, books can be imported in, but they're not central. And the greatest use of books now in libraries are rare books, which actually touching and feeling them and, and they can't be made, ver I mean, they're di we digitize them too, but we use them in, in learning. So libraries have, totally transformed, um, except those that haven't been given the budget to transform. Right. So, so let, me, let me put a small twist on that. Um, the, the library system I talked about, uh, the public library in, in Chicago, one third of the space is a performing center. Uh, now I mention that because it is the performing part that makes it social and makes it visible. One of the troubles is, and you did put the caveat in about kids are working together. Okay, but often you see in these computers, in fact, originally, if you go into an architectural studio of 10 or 15 years ago, you found, you found each student no longer having pinups, uh, and they were just working on their screen. So they lost completely a form of sociality. And that's just anathema to most of our students today. Right. Working alone. And, and it should be. Dr. Carl? Yeah. Can I put in a plug for the physical library with the open stacks? <laughs> um, I very, it, it, it may not be, uh, may, it may be, turn out to be something we can no longer afford. Uh, I very rarely go to the library. I mostly sit in my office and, and do searches for journals. But when I get into a new subject that I know nothing about, and I have no clue as to how to begin, what I usually do is, is search the library catalog and try to find the various places that books that appear to be on this subject are. And then I go to the stacks and I start pulling books off the shelf and I try to find one that I can read. Uh, and if, this is just immensely valuable in terms of actually getting into an area that you're totally ignorant in. And so, I'd love to see the physical library continue to exist and exist in its present form, even though I only use it very rarely. So, so, so I, I, I hope you didn't hear us as arguing that physical books shouldn't exist. In fact, we've been able to now measure uh, that in fact the use of books in the, public, the Chicago Public Library in this new space has shot way up. Although everybody is constructing kind of you know virtual media, uh, you know uh, digital media for their for their points, I think the the real challenge we have as we move to a world of constant change is how do you make sure you don't lose serendipity? Because when you walk through the stacks, there's a serendipitous experience, and that that is something which um, you know is, is is priceless, and how we guarantee we don't have we don't lose that is also important. Now it's just time for one more question. Yeah, JSB, uh, this is sort of a question about uh, when you went back to those challenges for the na uh, national science challenges, right. you know, those technical challenges like clean water, uh, housing, that kind of stuff. I was just thinking about the $300 house 